Yo, and we are back. It's the Drop Night Show. Me, K Wonder, and we have our guest, Victor Carrington, in the building. Yeah. He didn't give me instructions on how to get in the building. <laughs> oh, here oh, we yeah, go. It's, it's like, for Knox. Address. It's for Knox. You, nobody yeah, you, you, nobody gotta, can gotta, get like, in here. We be outside like, oh, is it going to Nobody can get in here. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so um, the one thing I want to talk about, all right. You have your book. Yes. Just, Just when, when you, you thought, thought you, you knew me. Knew me. Everyone, this is the book. <laughs> All right. Mind you, I don't know if we can get a zoom in on what he's wearing. Okay. But he is a fresh to death in this outfit. Okay. So I want everyone to um, definitely. Okay. So you started writing this book. When did you start writing it? At what point? It started as a college age? essay in 2002, and I didn't know I was writing a book. Really? Wow. Okay. The I uh, went into English class one day, and the top she had a bunch of topics on the board, mm-hmm. and you can choose any one to write about, but the only one you couldn't fictionalize was in the life, the occurrences in the life of. Mm-hmm. And at the mm-hmm. time, I didn't understand why I chose that topic, but I did, and I wrote about the criminal part of my life. But at that time, I was in Virginia. I had only been home a couple of years, and I was in the school, and I was doing everything I could to keep people from knowing I was a convicted felon because it was so hard in Virginia to get jobs mm-hmm. as a convicted felon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now I understand that was part of my journey, mm-hmm. and that was meant to happen the way mm-hmm. that it did. Mm. Awesome. That is very interesting. Um, so when you start the book, you mentioned how you were born in Newburgh, Germany. You were an army yes. brat. Uh-huh. You were an army brat. Yes. And you moved with your aunt at an early age who's raised you, well, for the most part, while your parents were still in Germany. Right. And you were explaining how that was like a great feeling your aunt loved you so much so much guidance and all of this and then your mom and dad moved back into the u.s correct and just give just us a brief um stroll down memory lane of what it was like when your parents got back you know like you were at what age was this it was early on they came back and we lived in New York and then Philadelphia. Okay, so and you were familiar with Philly oh, streets. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, when they split, when I was six, we were back in Virginia at that time, mm-hmm. and they split. It was it was rough because my dad was is he's a piece of work. I mean, he was really abusive, mm-hmm. physically and okay. verbally. He's a very mean man. He's is just, it because of the military aspect no, of just, his life, or just, that's just generally just, how he is? He's just a mean man. He's okay. um, a really selfish guy. His mom, my grandmother, babied him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was the youngest boy, and anything he did, he got away with it. And uh. he wasn't held accountable for his bad behavior at all. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, so you're you're back living with your parents, and you um, you know you said your mom was abused by your dad, and you remember feeling so much hatred toward him and wanting to always protect your mother. Correct. Um, so then your mother introduces you to shoplifting after they split. After they after split. They after they split. So how, she what got age caught. was that exactly? I was six. Okay. She got caught shoplifting at a grocery store called Winn Dixie. Oh, yeah. Everybody know Winn Dixie in the South. (laughs) She got caught, and I don't know what made her teach my sisters and I how to do it. Mm -hmm. Looking back on it now, if I had to make a guess, I would say that it was because she had gotten caught and she didn't want to get her hands dirty anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she put her kids to it. But because they were daddy's girls, they didn't really do what she wanted them to do. Mm-hmm. I was the mama's boy, and I did whatever she asked me to do. Mm-hmm. So that became my way of life for her. But when reading the reading the book, what? Why did you feel like that was the only way to get some kind of affection from your mother to do those kind of criminal things? I don't know if. At that time, what was going on, I just knew that she was very unhappy with my dad. Mm -hmm. And when they split and when this came about, these things made her happy when I would bring her stuff that she wanted. Mm -hmm. Or she would have me, you know, she would tell me stuff that she wanted. And it reached a point where, as I got older, she would just be around me and would say, I sure wish I had this. I wish I had that. And that's all I needed to hear. That was my trigger, and I was off to get it. Wow. Wow. And so when I put the book together and I mentioned that, it was... 
I took a moment to think, well, maybe sometimes she really wasn't on the phone with someone, you know, by the time I became a teenager because she knew that's all I had to do was hear it. Hear it. My mom is a hustler, you know. She seems she, very manipulative as well. She's very yeah. manipulative. She's very manipulative. Wow, okay. So, fast forward, um, you, 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 you get into your whole works or your career, so to speak, at a young <laughs> That's age. That's exactly what it was. It was a career. A career at a very <laughs> young age of becoming this um, – Straight up booster. You were like the big booster. I, I, I've heard, and I mean, when I was reading the book, I was like, how do you boost the air conditioner? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, wait, I'm fast forwarding to this. So because you um, were doing these Ill, illegal things to please your mom and just, you know, feel some type of like you're doing something for her, you wind up going to um, juvie at a young Several age. Times, yeah. Several times. So tell us a little bit about that. Being pulled out of the home, it was it was tough because that what I thought was that was my support system. Mm-hmm. So it was really tough the first time they pulled me out. I remember we were living in these apartments and my mom we were friends with this white girl and her daughters and whatever. And I ran over and told her, said the police are looking for me. She said, Get in here, close the door. And she went over there to find out what was going on. Mm-hmm. And they came back and said, Yeah, you gotta go. Um, so I went to the detention home in Danville, Virginia. Mm-hmm. And it was rough because you know, at that time, I thought my mom was my best friend, mm-hmm. and then I'm being taken away. I'm not at home, and it was just—it was hard. It was hard. Mm-hmm. Do you? Why did you feel like she didn't protect you at that point? I don't think there was anything she could have done at that point because the charges had already been filed. Mm-hmm. It was a petty larceny charge or something like mm-hmm. that. But coming home, there was no discipline. Mm-hmm. There was no. You cannot do this. Mm-hmm. You have to stop this. It was more so, oh, I wish I had such and such. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. Constantly. Wow. So she continued to use that, you know, manipulation to get oh, yeah. more things. So, all right. Then, you know, you get out of that. You come back home. It's sort of like an in and out, in and out thing. Uh, what would you? All right. So now I want to get to this air conditioner thing. Because you said as you got older, <laughs> all right. Things you got, got bigger. To, yeah. The Things trash can. Bigger. It started with okay. He said he was at like you know a Macy's or somewhere, a mall. You were in a mall. You were at a specific specific. It was store a value of, city. Of, oh, it was a value it city. A value okay, city. so you're at the value city, mm. and he's like, you know what? The, I see a trash can over there. So you started to load well, the you trash know what? can up. How interestingly that came up. It was really weird. I, my, I've always been really quick on my feet. Yeah. Okay. And my mom and my little sister have been in a car accident, and so this was the day before. Thanksgiving, uh-huh. and people were out doing their last minute grocery shopping. They had got their little checks from the accident, so they were out shopping, and no one was buying me anything. <laughs> so I'm in the store walking around. No one is saying, Victor, get this in the basket. <laughs> Victor, do this. So I'm seeing all this stuff that I like, all these shoes, and it was about five or six pairs of shoes. Yes. And I'm thinking, how am I get these shoes out of the store? You know, and I knew I couldn't trade them out for the one pair because then, you know, that would defeat the purpose of right. So I was just walking around the store, just not even really looking for a way. But then I just was in the men's department walking, and I saw this trash can that someone had left there. It was a kitchen-sized trash can. Mm -hmm. And it just hit me, put the shoes in this trash can. (laughs) And so I grabbed the trash can and went into the shoe department and put all of them that I wanted in there and just walked out the door with it. And it felt so exhilarating. It was like a high for me. So each time you stole, you felt that way. Oh, God, yeah. Wow. Okay. Because I had such an ego with this, I couldn't be touched. If Mm -hmm. if I put it in the basket, it was mine. Wow. It was not to stay. Especially a damn air conditioner. It was not to stay in the store. (laughs) Uh And how how the air conditioner came. Please. The trash can... Eventually, it just continued to grow because I had a friend of mine that would come check me out of school, uh-huh. and we would go up there, and we would hit this store two and three times a week. Mm. And within a matter of weeks, we were at a forty-five gallon trash can because wow. I had the heart to do that. No one else had. The yes, heart to you that. have to have balls of steel <laughs> to do some shit like that. And we're not trying to give no boosting one on one class right, right. now because that's what it sounds like. <laughs> boosting one on one, but but I mean, if you're gonna do it, you have to be good at it. And right. and, and I was. This was my life, and because I didn't have anyone saying, this is not right. You right. should not do this. Your aunt, okay, because uh, backtracking, you stole from your aunt. My but mom she, had me stealing money on my aunt's out purse. Your aunt's yeah. purse, but you, your aunt still forgave you and loved you Because she knew that. I didn't have the money. I was maybe seven or eight. I yeah. didn't have the money, so she knew I had to be giving it to I my I mean, mother. that's what kids do. So like, your aunt never was like, Victor, no, no, no? She used she to ever? say that to me, but... 
I got scared. Something happened, and I got scared and moved back home with my mom. Mm -hmm. So my aunt only had one son mm -hmm. who was an adult, lived in D.C., married with his own child. His wife did not like my aunt at mm -hmm. all, so she wouldn't let her son come home. My mom, thinking she has all the answers, would go to, like, these voodoo doctors. Mm. root doctors and things in the, in the south and she took my aunt over to one and we went on this Sunday and I would never forget this day because the house just stunk I mean it literally stunk and she took my aunt out back to her she put a root on your aunt, on your aunt. <laughs> so she took her out back to the little um, shed that she kept all of her concoctions in and I remember when she came in back in the house with my aunt we were ready to go she gave her the instruction and you remember what I told you you're gonna pour this jar into the river that flows whichever way or whatever, mm -hmm. wow. and you're gonna go out on the back porch and you're gonna call his name three times every night before you go to bed, and you're gonna chew on this root to get her son to come. To make her son come home, cause okay. he wouldn't come home. She hadn't seen him in years, and they—he was her only child, so they were really right, close. right, right, right. I think wow. that's why she clinged to me so much. Yes, right. I was about to say that yeah. as well. So, I was a kid. I didn't think anything about it. You know, we did stop by the river, and they did get out, and she poured it, and. I didn't think anything about it. And every night I would hear her on the back porch, Josh, 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 you know, still not thinking anything about it. Mm -hmm. That third day when the bus pulled up, his car was in the driveway. Wow. And when I went in, I hugged him and I said, what are you doing here? He said, I don't know. I just got in the car and started driving. And it literally freaked me out. It literally wow. freaked me out. Woo! And I said, okay, I, I can't stay here. So that's when I went back home with my mom. Whoa. Yeah. You know, voodoo. Voodoo is, listen. I mean, I can't are, say are that had something to do with it, but I know that it <laughs> literally freaked me out when I saw it because I said, I don't know. You, you know, you it freaked me out. You ain't got to be a brain scientist right. to know yeah. that. And no, but, you know, that's a whole other topic. We're going to save that. But, um, so, okay. Whew. Man, and the shit gets deeper. Yeah. All right. So he, he This just scratching the surface. Pretty much. And mind you, like, I wasn't even I'm still reading this book. I ain't even gonna hold you or lie. I'm still reading the rest of this book. Because <laughs> I had so much going on. But um you get locked up again. At this time you're a uh teenager at this point, right? Um I I'm, I'm I'm jumping back and mm -hmm. forth, mind you. Oh yeah. All right. Let me go back. You said at a young age that all the kids in your neighborhood had the tree houses. And Club that houses. was when you clubhouses. Club. Okay. So that's when you first had your uh, encounter. Your 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 somewhat idea or feeling of liking the same sex. No. When I was five I knew something was off. But okay. I didn't know what it was. I could look at my dad's friends and feel some type of way. Oh, oh, right, because you did say you were different, and right. you felt I like you were different. I didn't know what it was. I mean, it was a kid. I didn't know what I was experiencing. I didn't know. But when we had these, I was, growing up, I wasn't a popular kid. I didn't get invited to the cool kids table, mm -hmm. you know. And early on, I found that me making other people laugh is what made them, what I thought, like me. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, me giving them things. Right. right. Made them like right. me. Not knowing at that time they were just using me for a giggle or for whatever they you wanted. Were, right. Also knowing that my mom and my sisters did the same thing. Mm -hmm. That they only used me for what they wanted. And then the moment they got it, I wasn't any good to them until they needed it again. But I was so insecure. Wow. I would always go back like a, you know, puppy wagging, wagging his tail. Like, yeah. okay, I'm happy to be back, you know. So, and that's how that was. But with that guy, um, he gave me attention. Mm -hmm. You know, and he made me feel different. Mm -hmm. And I used to rush home and couldn't wait to change my clothes to go to my clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have friends. And, you know, people picked on me a lot. I was a little small kid with a big head. And so his name is David, right? In the book, it's, it's David. David. Okay. Oh, okay. So you oh, have so to you help. wasn't you using real people's names. I didn't, yeah, I didn't use the real names. No, That's it's good. not my place to. And we're back on the Drop Night Show. It's your girl, K Wonder, Sean Beasley, yep. um, Water Ice Radio. We have Victor Carrington, author, um, with this crazy uh, autobiography about his life. You all definitely would want to go to Amazon and pick that up, as well as all the uh, book outlets to purchase that. And it's called Just When You Thought You Knew Me the by Victor Carrington. The in the life of Victor Carrington, y'all. Yeah. And you're originally from Virginia, right? 
Well, by way of being born in Germany, Germany and living here in New York and then back to Virginia. That's okay. where yeah. my family, my parents originated from. Okay. Halifax, Virginia. Okay. Halifax, awesome. Virginia. That's where I went to high school. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's just dive right on in. <laughs> diving right, right. Diving back <laughs> okay, in. Okay. They're diving me in. Okay. So, Brian. Yes, Brian. I read the book. Not all of it. Wait, so Brian. I read a good part it. of this book. A good part, okay. Yeah. All right. And Brian was talked about a lot. Brian had a significant role in my life and not the best way. Not at all. So. It started off good. Tell us how you met Brian and why it wasn't the best experience for you. So when I went to prison, this, uh, got sentenced the second time, I was in the Danville City Jail. Mm-hmm. And I got a 10-year sentence. In the jail, nervous. Okay, I'm going back to prison. You know, I had only been out less than two years. I'm going back. And so I came out to be a, Well, I used to get these letters from this person, and I didn't know who, because I was in I block. He was in B block. We didn't interchange blocks. You know, inmates did not interchange. If you weren't in that block, you didn't, you know, unless someone came to the door and opened up, whatever. Unless you went to church, you would see someone going to church. Mm-hmm. But other than that, you didn't get to see. You got church inmates. in prison? Yeah. Wow. Sean, you are child. Uh, Listen. Yeah. He is the most naive individual when it comes to criminal activity, <laughs> justice for criminals, re- justice you reform, and prison. No. Mind you, his whole you family is gangster no. as hell. So you would think that, that he would know something. <laughs> his family is not no motherfucking cookie cutter family. These niggas <laughs> gamble. Shoot people and do all that. Oh, shit. But you the innocent one. You the innocent but, one. Right. But he the he the wait. You the innocent Jail one. has a church. Go, bye. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you're canceled. So. So. Uh, <laughs> um. He was sending me these letters and I didn't know who he was. And one day he came and opened up the window to our cell block and you know my nickname was Tweety. And he would. Where did that come from, Tweety? Because when I was a kid, I was I was at Barrett Learning Center. Uh-huh. You ain't find that offensive. No. Tweety. No. Why no, tell I? us where it came from. Tweety, so Tweety at, is like sweetie. Whatever. <laughs> so I was at um, Barrett Learning Center, my first probably big juvenile place that I went. Mm-hmm. And there was this kid named Broadnax. He was so talented. He could draw and he could route out mm-hmm. in the wood and stuff. And I was a real small kid with a big head and big ears. And he <laughs> said, you look like Tweety Bird. And he routed me. <laughs> this, he really made the Tweety Bird into this wood thing. And with this thing with, hi, I'm Tweety. And I held on to it for years. Oh, wow. And um, so that's where it came from. Okay. Okay. So. Mm. I was, someone said, Tweety, somebody at the door for you. And I go, and he said, I'm the one that's been sending you the letters. I'm Nard. Well, I can say his name now, but he said, I'm Nard. That's his real name. This was the one from New York? Bernard. This was the one that's that was his from real name. North? Or he, he was, was from New Jersey, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, he was from a... Uh, so Brian is Bernard. he was Bernard. a big-time thug. Brian is Bernard. He was wow. a kingpin. Well, that's was, a... Yeah, okay. Listen, it's a lot of Bernards. Okay. So anyway. Well, he died, so... Oh, God rest um, his soul. He... I'm the one that's been sending you the letters. And I thought, so? Mm-hmm. And I walked away. Mind you. Not to cut you off, we're gonna we're gonna keep it up, Bernard. But you were in jail as a gay man. You made this jail experience seem like gay men need to go there. Yeah. Go, <laughs> no, and like no, that it is wasn't not. like how <laughs> was it really for a gay man in prison? Because you made it seem like that is the hookup spot. No, that was not. The hookup <laughs> and spot. if you that gay, you just should get arrested. The, the thing was with this book was I didn't want to put any sexuality stuff in this book at all. Mm-hmm. But my editor, we tussled back and forth for three days. And she said, Victor, you're writing an autobiography. People know that you're gay. If you don't give them some detail about your gay life, they're going to think everything else you write is fake. Boy, think, okay, you gave a whole this, detail. But he's not talking about what we already know about him. So why would we believe this? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, I came out to be a trustee. And as a trustee, you go into everybody's catwalk. You feed them the trays through the slide. And you go collect the trays and, you know, whatever. Get towels or whatever. So you had an experience of being protected be- by the CEOs and being liked by not the inmates. Not in prison. Not in prison. Not in okay. prison. All right. Only so, in the jail. Not in the jail. Okay. Not in the jail. So I came out to be a trustee, and he would come and sit at the bars, and he called me Sunshine. I don't know why everybody wanted to say Sunshine. So you had Tweety and Sunshine. Got you. And then eventually Champagne. But anyway. Ooh. Yes! Uh, <laughs> okay. so champagne anyway, was in that white uh, so, jail, the redneck jail. Um... <laughs> 
And he would talk to me. And then there was this guy who, this white guy who mm-hmm. came in the gym. It was a big story in Denver. He had killed his wife and cut her, their unborn baby out there. Out of her. Wow. I remember that, yes. So Ooh. he was in K Block, which was isolation. They had him on suicide watch. And I used to go in there because no one wanted to go in there. I would go in there and give him his tray and take his tray. And one day he was in there just crying out of control. And I just stopped. I said, you know, you okay? What's wrong? He was like, I'm going to die in here. No, I have no family. My wife's family don't love me. My family don't love me. And I really, being already insecure, I really went into a space where I don't want to end up alone like this. So I already knew Bernard was checking for me. So I just moved into his block (laughs) to get with him because I needed that moment of protection Protection, and I knew that he was you know I needed someone to be there for me to love that love and we were fine in the jail we were actually fine so of course I transferred first not knowing if he was but you did mention that he was very um in the shit yes he was always in his clutch yes very but he wasn't abusive Mm -hmm. you know I that at that point at that point I didn't you know uh, but I was young. And you had never been in any fights before? I had been in fights. I used to fight all the time. In fact, the only time my older sister and I have ever gotten along in life is when we were fighting people. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a, well, shit, we, all three of us have the same parents, and she and I have hated each other from childhood. We have never gotten along. Wow. The few times we have tolerated each other have mm-hmm. been few and far between. How is your relationship with your family now? We don't have a relationship. You don't have a relationship with your mother, or your father, nobody? Mm-hmm. Is it because of the book? My mom, because I'm not hustling anymore, and then she wanted all of my money. She actually called the police to try to get me locked up again. Right, okay. That's how I ended up moving out of her right, house. Right, right, right. My dad, we formed a relationship when I was 32 for nine years. Everything was great mm-hmm. until I had some back issues and I was rushed to the hospital. He and my stepmom mm-hmm. came down because they were listed as my emergency contact. My best friend and her mom rushed down. And then my friend from work came over and she had called two of my gay friends that she knew, said, mm-hmm. you know, they were two, at that time, they were two of my closest friends. Mm-hmm. And she said, you all need to get here because this looks bad. Mm-hmm. And they came in, they spoke to everybody and they were introduced to my dad and my stepmom. Mm-hmm. And he kind of fell back. I didn't pay any attention to it. And then when I came here for Christmas the next year, my aunt was like, uh, I said, I don't know why, but your brother is just not answering my calls anymore. You know, what's going on with him? She said, well, you know, everybody in the South don't like the gay lifestyle. And I said, what do you mean? We talked about it. You know, he was really big on the Carrington name. Mm-hmm. He, and he told me, he said, as long as you are not doing anything to embarrass the family, you good, you working, you got your own home, I'm good. Mm-hmm. And I said, but we talked about it and he was fine. And she said, but didn't you have two gay friends that come to the hospital? And I said, I also had other friends there. Why were they the two men? Singled mentioned? out. Right. And that's right. what it was. He fell back. And we have not spoken were... since then. That was in 2009. Wow. wow. And we, mind you, after all the years of not having a relationship because I thought I hated him, we went, did never discuss the letter I wrote him. We picked the ball up and we ran with it. Mm-hmm. That put me back in touch with my family here. That's how I started coming back up here in 2002. Coming I hadn't seen my Philly. grandmother since mm-hmm. I was seven years old. My Any family up here or New right. York since I was seven years old. Mm-hmm. So, because my mom didn't let us come. Mm-hmm. And for me to come back up here, it was just love. It was right. in my cousin. It was Shanae needed Ship too. You know what I mean? Plus too. My cousin Shanae Ship, my <laughs> closest. I mean, I just love her. She's here. And her aunt was my favorite aunt. She mm-hmm. died of breast cancer in 2008. And um, it was just so much love. We had fun. Mm-hmm. And he and I had a great relationship. My stepmom and I, great. I was calling her mom. And I would call him like, Mom, I'm hungry. She would, well, come on up here because they kept food, overflow of food right. in the freezer. And she would, you know, get me something and, you know, for the week or whatever. We had a really great relationship. We, he and I would call each other at least four times a week. Wow. We and then it great, just. Because he saw two of my gay friends that really weren't flamboyant, but you knew they were gay. But mm-hmm. literally, they were there 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. They came and said, what can we do? And they told my friend, my friend Carolyn said, we need to get his car because they're going to keep him and we'll put it in my garage. And they left. Go do that. So I guess it was the, f- and I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry because that's very unfortunate. Um, you, you obviously. Especially because we you, were good. Right. And and on top of that, to me, you have, you uh, bring across an energy that, you know, you just, I'm, I'm big on energy. So I yeah. just feel like. You're a decent person. You know what I mean? You're not malicious. I'm the left not a little evil. bit sometimes. Everybody does. But right. at the end of the day. Especially top, me, right? You live in the left. Shh. <laughs> okay. Living the life. Let's be honest. Okay. Um, but yeah, we were really good. He and I, he came there when I bought my first home. Do you think you guys can get back? Oh, no, we'll never get back. 
It's 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 to is the it point that of no bad? Return. It's that bad because he's going around. He was going around telling everyone that I was faking in the hospital and imitating how I was, and I was literally in pain. I have a lot of hardware on my spine from those injuries before the hardware came. You know, mm-hmm. as we were building up to it, and he he just and the the back problem was an issue when Bernard initially. It felt no, like he have, bended your back, right? I, it probably could have started, started, but it I didn't have any started. pain from okay. then after that. You know, I didn't feel. But it, it was probably today. wear and tear right. that started right. from there. Yeah, because that was kind of a hard. Thing because you. So went was through- the relationship with Brian in your book that bad? It was really. I'll say so. I got trained. They called me to leave. And you know, well, you don't know, because, but you know, when you get called yeah. to leave, you're going to the system. You don't know where you're going mm-hmm. until you pull up to the gate. Mm-hmm. No, I definitely don't know. Because they don't tell you where you're going for security purposes. Mm-hmm. You say you're going to keep in touch. I wrote back to him and I didn't hear anything back. So I was like, okay, whatever. I wasn't seeing anyone else, but I just wasn't thinking about him. Mm-hmm. And maybe a month and a half had gone by. Mm-hmm. And... I get this call, someone said, tweet it, someone up in receive and asking about you. I was like, who is it? Some nigga named Nard. I was like, who? <laughs> and some nigga named Nard asking about you. I was like, whatever. And then, because at that time, this particular prison, the receiving unit was building six, mm-hmm. dorm A and B, and it was a wall separated with a closed off door. And then all of a sudden, when they came into the building, it said, Nard, somebody wants you at the, at the door tweet, and I go and look, and it was him. I was like, Oh, but I wasn't checking for him because I was like, dude, I wrote you a month and a half ago. You didn't write me back. So I'm like, we good. We had our moment. We good. Mm-hmm. That day in the mail, that letter came. <laughs> wow. So I kind of felt like it was my like, damn. So, okay, uh, let me go head on. Whatever. Not knowing at that time that him being in there and then running to some of his gophers from the street, yeah. that it boosted his ego. And he started getting drugs and drugs and drugs in there. And he had people ODing off of raw hair Wow. Inside of prison? I mean, we were, oh, yeah, yeah. We were living, it goes down. We were living wow. large in prison. It goes <laughs> But whenever he would get mad, Sheesh. he would come take everything from me down to my soup, my soup toothbrush. dish and my toothbrush yeah. holder. Because he knew that was his control over And that. you didn't have, you said you had got the, you had the job cleaning. Well, just before that, I stopped okay. getting money from home he, because, because he, he told you. Because to, he was like, it's my and job. And you were young. You were like 20. I was 21. Yeah. Something, something. Okay, well, he's going to take care of me, blah, blah, blah. Not knowing all of the attachments that come with it. If it's his money, it's his rules. I didn't know that. Right. Wow. And so how, are you in a relationship now? No. Okay. So with relationships that you deal with, you make sure that you don't have that oh no no, no one can ever take care of me like that again should you can damn near tell me to shut up and i'm out <laughs> <laughs> because i just don't have time for that i mean i'm too seasoned for that mm-hmm. and i was young i was 21 and yeah. i don't have time for that and because of the experiences when i look back on that was a dark moment of putting this book together it, during it the was week that very I did very messed up he like. was very controlling and the day he told me that he would see me in a pine box before he see himself without me was and then the first day, he, wow. when the day, first day he punched me in my face, I was like, oh, this is really happening. This is really surreal. But and did I you not no feel help. like it was going to mount to that? Because y'all no, were arguing all the I, time, right? Well, he used to threaten me a lot. But I used to fight and I used to have mouth and I used to be like, you ain't going to do nothing to me, blah, blah, blah. And he would never do it because by the time we physically saw each other, he had calmed down. But not saying that I provo- that it was my fault that he did it the mm-hmm. first time, but mm-hmm. I do know I contributed to it because I accept, I own my behavior. If I do it, I say it, I own it. He had been evol- involved with this transsexual from years ago. He told me that he hadn't seen and this person from years he went and from years being, ago. He went from being a, a, a straight man to liking transsexuals to straight out being gay. No, the thing is, and we all know, well, he those was in type prison. of men like transsexuals. Who? Who? You said all type of men? I said those type of men. Who, what? Thug men? Kingpins? Like, like you don't go to hell, Lord. But when I met him, that was his third time in prison. Y'all. So I don't know if he just (laughs) indulged every time he was in prison or what. But he told me, he, he voluntarily told me about this person and he hadn't said anything. He said that he hadn't spoken to this person over four years. Mm-hmm. I went in his locker literally looking for something one day when mm-hmm. he was at the library and saw this bag of letters. I thought, oh, let me see. Because I noticed he was getting a lot of mail. Right. And I said, let me see who this is. And I, and all of a sudden I saw all these money orders and recent <laughs> letters and recent <laughs> some from that week. Now, mind you, 
I'm 21. If I had been on my game at that time, I wouldn't have cared because the money was taking care of me. Mm -hmm. I would have just paid it and kept it moving. Mm. But because I felt like you telling me you love me and now you have this person right you, I have a problem with this. Right. So I brought it up to him. I said, when last time you heard from Gigi? I ain't heard from Gigi in about And then you was years. like, liar! And I was like, but <laughs> Gigi just sent you money this week. Oh, right. And he was like, how you know? I saw I saw it in your locker. And before I knew it was like, bam. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> but she did in the eye. So that kind of woke me up real quick. Thank God. Well, look, we're about to get into this other song. There's so much. But you know what? We can't give it all away here because we'll be here to 12 o'clock talking about this book, y'all. So we giving y'all some little spillers, some spillers and some spoilers. Get about Go Amazon. get Just the think you knew book. Me. Just Go think get you knew it. Me, the life of Victor Carrington. And mind you. Oh, it's a lot. This is about an African-American gay male growing up in the 80s and going through his, uh, you know, life ills and learning about his journey. And there's something that you mentioned in the back of the book, Towards the Reflections, that I want to bring up when we come back. Okay. Um, we're going to get into this next show sh uh, song. Sean, what is coming? What, what song is Yo, Jaden Smith is out here killing it. This is his new song called Batman. Jada Smith, Will it's the Smith. Son of, yes. yes. It's it's the Drop Night Show um, on Water Ice Radio. Stay, come back, y'all. We're back. It's the Drop Night Show. I'm your girl, K Wonder, with my co-host, Sean Beasley. Yep. We have author Victor Carrington, okay, with his a critically acclaimed book, In the Building. But right In now, let's, let's get into, um, we got to give our, our pay some bills and, and yeah, talk sure. to our sponsors. Shout out to Samson Technology for sponsoring our show. They actually sponsor all the Water Ice Radio's um, podcasts. They supply all of the equipment for us to produce these shows. So we definitely want to shout out to our major sponsor, Samson Technology. Also sponsor um, and shout out to Water Ice Radio, which is our parent company. Uh, make sure you go to waterice.com to sign up for the email list to stay connected to everything, um, your everyday scoop of everything Philly. I know I'm going to say that. But also with Water Ice, you can also get these free Globe Trotter tickets. Okay, we're giving away free two, I believe, uh, free Glo Globe free. Harlem Globe F -R -E -E. free Harlem Globe Trotter tickets. They're coming to Philadelphia. So if you want to take your kids or your girl or your guy to have some fun and watch some and see some good basketball skills, definitely go to waterice.com to sign up and get those and make sure you sign up for that email blast so you can make sure you have your scoop to everything philly um so now we're back into this all right we're gonna sum it up because we have so we wait could, a minute Let's we talk could about... be here for like a whole like i said before the before the song we could be here for a whole nother hour no we're gonna keep victor here the whole show <laughs> yeah <laughs> we have some other uh topics, topics to talk about into. you know it is you know black history even though black people only get a little short 28 days <laughs> <laughs> 28 days. That's enough. But um, so what change is coming. Yes. Lord, so thank what you. I wanted to talk about. So you had the situation, right? When you start doing this book and you was employed. Yes. So tell us the story about that employer who. How would I say it? Who terminate you? Be terminated you because of your book. Uh, so I work for TG Hair Care, Bedhead, Catwalk, S Factor, Bedhead for Men. Um, oh, wait, okay. So what is your profession right now? Do you right now, I'm a compliance regulatory specialist, custom service specialist for an uh, energy company. I handle all their state agency complaints for, oh, wow. for the energy company. Okay. Wow. So I was working for TG Hair Care. And you currently live where? In Dallas. Dallas, Texas. Okay. Uh, TG is based in Louisville, Texas, so the corporate office. So I was there. And I went to the general manager. Elisa and I told her, I said, hey, I have a book coming out. She was like, oh, what is it about? I said, well, it's my autobiography. And she said, oh, okay, did you mention TG? I said, no. She said, then, then you're fine. Well, then the book came out um, while I was here, actually, in 2015. It came out. From, that's what I was saying before when I tried to the book and when they said no, when I went to Amazon, you don't get to choose the date. Once you send them your package, it rolls they out They roll it, okay. So I was here in a hotel, and I got noticed. Oh, my God, your book is amazing. I was like, how do you know? And it was because like, it's online. I said, oh. So anyway, 
Um, everything was going fine. Everybody in the office was buying it because it went to number one. It came out about 8.30 p.m. the night of December 29th. By 10 a.m. December 30th, it was number one. Wow. So it beat Muhammad Ali's latest autobiography two of the four weeks that it was wow. number wow. one. So I was super excited about that. So, so did you get real paid off of that book or like? I got, it was, it's still selling. So it's, okay, it's doing so well. Still it's doing paid. well. It's right. doing well. It paid. So, um, but you know, bills got to be paid. What do you, you got to pay your production and all that <laughs> stuff. So anyway, um, went to my general manager told her the book was coming out. She was like, okay, fine, whatever, whatever. We all took a business trip to Cancun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All the people from the field. The salespeople, the stylists, the cutters, the colorists, everybody was there and they heard about this book. So everybody was buzzing about this book. It was about maybe four or five hundred of us there. Mm-hmm. So they were buzzing about this book. Mm-hmm. Everybody was buying it and because this is something they never knew about me. Because people tell me, and I appreciate I don't look like what I've been through. People mm-hmm. say that Well, um, cause you should look real bad. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so what they said is that um, we would have never imagined this, you know. And I've even had people question this book because they said, I don't fit the mold mm-hmm. for someone who's going through mm-hmm. this. So in doing over in Cancun, everybody was finding a book. Everything was going great. And when we came back, I hired a publicist and we started my book tour. I did a six state multiple city book tour. Everybody went crazy about this book. And the moment I started going on TV, because I had to do, my publicist had me doing media whenever I would go to an area to do a book signing. Mm-hmm. Uh, NBC and Shreveport was my first television interview. Mm-hmm. TG lost their mind. So the HR called me in the office and, well, you know, Victor, um, I've heard about your book and heard it's a really good book. An attorney for the company read the book, but we just feel like you can't talk about it at work. And I'm telling her I don't discuss it at work. If someone asks me how the sales or how it's a book tour, I would say it's fine, but I don't give the details because I wanted people to read it. Mm-hmm. And she just kept stressing on about how she couldn't do this if she wanted to because she, you know, she would never put a public business out there, blah, 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 blah. Basically discriminating against me. And then a month later, I was let go, and I was told that it was because they were restructuring the education department, but I was the only one at that time let go. And it took almost eight months before another person was let go. Wow. wow. So, oh, man, jeez. And at the time, I was scheduled to give a kidney away. And I recorded that conversation, because in Texas, you can do that. Oh. And I forgot all about it. You still have it? I do. And I... um was going to uh, give a kidney away to a close friend of mine in Virginia. Did you give a kidney away? No, because her heart wasn't strong enough oh, for it. Wow. So we wow. have to wait till her heart gets stronger. But at the time, that's what we were doing. We were focused on the testing and everything. And once we found out I was a match and I could give it to her, that's what my focus was. And I said, okay, my severance will take care of me for the rest of the year. I won't have to work while I'm recovering, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. I forgot about it. Mm-hmm. And then cleaning out my phone one day, I saw it. So I sent it to them. Ooh. And none of them ever responded. So they know it exists, Mm -hmm. but none of them. Yo, it's the Drop Night Show. It's your man, Sean BC. We are back. Me, K Wonder, and I guess Victor Carrington. Boy, oh boy, was this show juicy. When I tell you his Mm -hmm. book, you Mm -hmm. definitely need to go Mm -hmm. pick his book up. Yes, Just When You Thought You Knew Me by Victor Carrington, okay? Thank you so much, Victor, for being Absolutely. here. That is officially Yo, the end of the show. Thank you, Victor Carrington, Follow for stopping. Follow the Drop Night Show. Next Thursday, we'll be back. We have another guest coming in every Thursday at 8 p.m. on Water Ice Radio. Get the free tune-in app to find us. And follow us on social media, The Drop Night Show on Twitter, The Drop Night Show on Facebook, and The Drop Night Show on Instagram. And we out. Branded just drop. like that.